He was 16 hours in. His feet ached of blisters, cuts, and bruises. His whole body was exhausted, screaming at him to stop. He had already swam 2.4 miles, cycled 112 miles, and was now on his way to completing the final stage of his journey, a 26.2 mile run. Every step brought him closer to his goal, and every step forward meant ignoring the creeping self-doubt in his mind. 16 hours, 46 minutes, and 9 seconds after he began his journey, the hard work and pain paid off. He heard his name announced over the speaker as he crossed the finish line. Chris Nikic, you are an Iron Man. On November 7th, 2020, Chris Nikic completed his first Ironman. It's an incredible feat for anyone to accomplish, but there's something about Chris's story that makes it much more impressive. Chris was the first athlete with Down syndrome ever to complete an Ironman. It's a powerful story, but it's not as unbelievable as you think. The revolution is inclusion, and we have spent over half a century working to create a more open, a more welcoming environment for everybody, trying to end discrimination by opening the hearts and minds of people all over the world. As we say, the 97% of the population who do not have an intellectual disability. And how do we create an environment for them so that they are more inclusive in everything that they do and that they are more accepting of people with intellectual disability in their communities and that they truly understand the gifts and the talents and the great benefits that all persons, no matter who or what they are, can bring, the richness they can bring to communities and to society. That's what drives our inclusion revolution. That's Mary Davis, the CEO of Special Olympics, and she and her team are doing the work to create space for everyone to thrive, but inspiring those without intellectual disabilities to join them on that mission, while also helping those with disabilities reach their full potential is a multitasking mission that makes an Iron Man seem simple by comparison. So how is Special Olympics doing both? And what systems and mindsets is the organization leaning on to turn its inclusion revolution into a reality? I'm Jeremy Bergeron, Vice President of Media Partnerships here at mission.org, and this is Business X Factors. Each week, we'll take a look at the secret sauce that takes companies to the highest levels of success and unpack how they got there. We'll explore how these organizations are run, what's special about the people, culture, and processes that make it all happen. Mary has her own list of physical accomplishments. She's completed the New York Marathon and trekked both Mont Blanc and Mount Kilimanjaro. She was drawn to Special Olympics soon after college when she joined as a local program volunteer and coach. Her heart was captured and her mind was stimulated by the work facing the organization. She jumped from leadership role to leadership role and was even awarded a Person of the Year Award for her work on the 2003 World Summer Games and her years of service with Special Olympics Ireland. Her passion is almost tangible, and it's derived not from the paperwork and board meetings that fill her day as a CEO, but from a deep commitment to the people she gets to serve. What's your perspective on humans with intellectual disabilities that seem to not have a disability of the heart? I've seen so many humans with intellectual disabilities love deeper and harder and without conditions. And it seems almost more so than humans without intellectual disabilities. 
So would this be a new perspective that we as a collective can learn from this community? Definitely. And when I say that they are the best teachers, they are. They are the best teachers that we have. To teach love, to teach joy, to teach compassion, to teach beauty, to teach fearlessness as well. Mm. And all the other things, to teach courage, to teach determination. They do. It's not that they can. They do teach us uh, mm. so much. And you're so right about it's a joy. And I remember when I started out as a teacher working in, in a special school, it was that the essence of that very thing that kept me there, that kept me going, that kept me involved. I didn't want to leave because of you left work every day feeling joyful. Founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver in 1968, Special Olympics has found a way to share with the world that same thing that Mary was inspired by. Today, the organization works with more than 6 million athletes in more than 190 countries. They hold 94,000 competitions a year and get help from 1 million coaches and volunteers who help make grassroots operations possible. And while the organization has certainly grown and expanded over the half century since its founding, the mission has always remained the same to create a world of inclusion and community where every single person is accepted and welcomed, regardless of ability or disability. From the outside looking in, to see that much growth in 50 years is an astonishing success story and a powerful case study of what can happen when we bring humans together. But as Mary will tell you, the work is never done. There are so many more people and countries that have yet to be brought into the fold. We need to expand our work because at the moment we have about 6 million athletes in the program or people with intellectual disability. But when you think that there is anything up to 200 million people in the world with intellectual disability, we have a lot of expansion to do. And we need to look differently about how we're going to do that work as well and really move into the digital space. Recruiting new athletes isn't as easy as simply finding them and asking them if they'd like to join Special Olympics. In a world as big as ours, every country and culture has its own understanding of people with intellectual disabilities. And before Special Olympics can recruit athletes, it first has to help communities shake their biases. We go into all these countries. We don't stop. We go into all these countries to change attitudes, to change mindsets, to change behavior, and to have people understand. And one of the great challenges for us is that over 60 or 70 percent of our athletes come from developing countries. Mm. And in many of those countries, it's a stigma to have a child with intellectual disability. So you can imagine what it's like for the families of those children that are born yeah. with the, an, an intellectual disability. And they're often so sidelined. Too often, communities struggle to include people with intellectual disability. And a lot of it actually comes from not understanding. A lot of it comes from ignorance. So we find, for example, oftentimes in our school systems, we have, we have people with intellectual disability that are bullied, that are marginalized, that are maltreated. And it's because when we do dig deeper with our programming in those schools, it's because the students don't understand or they lack the education of the giftedness and the abilities of people with intellectual disability. And that's really how we came about to have the Unified Champion Schools program, which is a program where young people with and without intellectual disability come together on the sports field, in the gymnasium, in the swimming pool, they play together, they have fun together, and they begin to 
understand each other and they begin the the non-disabled person can look at the person with disability and say oh i can play basketball as good as you or i can play basketball to my ability level or i can do 10 pin bowling or whatever a sport is so it's a lot of what we try to do is educate the public to be more understanding to be more accepting these local programs are what make all the difference globally, but getting each started and keeping them running is its own challenge. It takes partnering with the right people in the right places and getting them to buy into the mission of the organization. We put an awful lot of effort into building partnerships, whether it's with the medical profession or the educational profession or the sports uh, the sports institutions, the sports governing bodies that we work so closely with as well. But also, we need to build sustainable government partnerships around the world. And that takes time and effort to do that, because every single one of those governments in the 190 plus countries that we're involved in, they should all be supporting the work that we're doing, mm. both financially supporting the work that we're doing, but also supporting it in other ways as well. And mm. that's always a challenge for us. How do we engage governments? How do we keep them involved? And again, empowering them to get involved at local level and to support the local program in their country. And to include people, to be inclusive of people right. with intellectual disability as well. So we still have a long way to go in terms of convincing all those governments, talking to them, getting them engaged. Mm -hmm. Our education ministers should be passing laws to have unified sports in every single school, in every single country. That's not happening mm -hmm. at the moment. Mm -hmm. So it's happening in some communities and in some countries, but not in all countries. So wow. there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in, in those areas. How is Special Olympics forming these partnerships, providing the education, and telling the stories to shift hearts and minds? Find out after the break. Creating an inclusive world starts with educating the world. Special Olympics understands this, but Mary also knows that in order to provide meaningful education and encourage lasting change, the organization must approach everything it does hyper-locally. We try to organize the movement from the bottom up as opposed to from the top down as well. So when we do our strategies, we worked very much as teams through the regions and get feedback from programs and the people and the coaches on the ground and the various different people that we have, family members, athletes themselves. Uh, and then we build our strategic plan out of that. So it's very much a bottom up organization as opposed to a top down organization. Okay. Special Olympics ingrains itself in everyday life of local communities. Special Olympics is not a yearly or every other year event. It's a team of people dedicated to helping athletes and communities get better every single day. The big difference, as I see it, between Special Olympics and the Paralympics is we're a grassroots organization. We are in over 195 countries providing over 100,000 competitions every year in local communities. We provide training, we organize clubs, we provide health opportunities. As I mentioned before, we have our extensive schools program all at local level, and we have our sports program obviously as well. Whereas the Paralympics and the Olympics are focused very much on the one-time big event that Got happens it. every four years, the Olympic Games and the Paralympic Games. Now we do have big games, award games as well, every second year, depending whether it's winter games or summer games. And that is our flagship and our highlight event. And that really does help us to drive movement around the world. But the real meat and guts of what we do is 
at that very local grassroots club level. And we put a lot of resources into that and into the development at that level. Because if we can improve the skills of the athlete at local level, and they're going to progress onwards then to qualify or to compete at World Games, then they're going to improve so much in terms of their skills and their confidence, their self-esteem, and their physical skills as well. A key way Special Olympics helps build that confidence and flush out ignorance is through storytelling. In order to help people think in different ways about what's possible, Special Olympics puts some of the biggest success stories on display. Stories are a powerful motivator. They offer a way to connect that resonates more than stats and figures ever could. And inspiring stories have helped Special Olympics not only build credibility with all kinds of audiences, they have been a useful tool to illustrate the damage of backward thinking and motivate change. We had one situation here where one of our athletes, Oliver, was bullied when he was in school. And he decided to put all his energy and resources into playing golf to such an extent that he was a six handicapper, which is anybody that knows wow. anything about golf would understand that's a pretty good handicap. Yeah. And he went on to participate in many world games, won gold medals. And when he came back to his community, he was recognized for his talents. And he was actually became the president of the local golf club. And now he was meeting people who had bullied him in school, who were actually apologizing to him and saying, look, we didn't know it was ignorance. We didn't know at the time. We have examples from refugee camps. We have examples from countries like Aaron Banda, a person who was tied to a tree from the age of two to seven. Again, it wasn't because the parents were cruel. It was because they had to go out and, and work in the fields and look after the other, all their family. And they had nowhere to put that person. And then when our volunteers came along and discovered Aaron and, and gave him his uniform, his sports uniform, and put a ball in his hand, he suddenly started to engage and get involved and started to play football and started to move around in the community. And then parents realize, of course he can do. There's lots he can do. They've never explored this. The stories of success don't just come from outside the organization either. Internally, Special Olympics boast a diverse staff with their own tales of resilience and personal development. We have a wonderful chief inspiration officer in our organization, an athlete called Loretta Claiborne from Pennsylvania. When she was born 60 years ago, her mother was told she's not going to really come to very much. You can just ignore her and look. At, you've got to look out for the rest of your family. Loretta went on to run 27 marathons. Wow. To be very accomplished public speaker. She has got numerous honorary degrees from universities. She's on our board of directors. She's just an amazing human being yeah. uh, to, to listen to. So these are all stories where we've seen the huge challenges that have existed. And our job is really to overcome those obstacles and those barriers and to have people understand that equity is important and that inclusion is really important. In the book, True Story, How to Combine Story and Action to Transform Your Business, author Ty Montague posits that there is a new type of business on the rise, one that steps beyond storytelling and uses story in a more powerful way. It's what he calls story doing. Story doing companies advance their narrative through action, not communication. They emphasize the creation of compelling and useful experiences and use story to drive tangible action throughout the company. 
Examples include Red Bull, Tom's Shoes, and Warby Parker. And being a story doing company pays off. Story doing companies are more positively perceived on social media, spend less money on paid advertising, and grow faster, both in revenue and share price than their storytelling counterparts. Special Olympics is without a doubt a story doing company. Every day, Mary and her team are living out another chapter and then turning around to leverage their stories to educate communities so that eventually Special Olympics can reach its ultimate goal. The utopia, of course, would be true inclusion where everybody is accepted and respected. Unfortunately, the tide is turning, but it hasn't turned enough. It's still a tragedy that there's so much stigma, that there's so much indifference in the world, that there's so much ignorance in developed as well as developing countries. And all of this, our athletes are facing all of that today. So that challenge remains enormous for us. And our job, as I see it, is to continue to fight fear, to fight the stigma and the bigotry that exists and to ensure that the true inclusion, not just lip service inclusion, but true inclusion. So the day a person with intellectual disability has open access to society, to community, can use their talents to go and work in the community, can play sport, can have fun, can, can do everything that everybody else does. That's when Special Olympics will feel like we're doing a good job. The year after completing his Ironman, Chris Nickich was awarded the Jimmy V Award for Perseverance at the ESPYs. In his acceptance speech, Chris talked about how he went from being excluded and isolated to being independent and included. He talked about how he had a dream that seemed impossible, but was actually, in his words, easy because he just got 1% better every day. By being committed to story doing and leveraging those stories to educate and recruit communities, Special Olympics is steadily making its inclusion revolution a reality for people around the world, 1% at a time. You've been listening to Business X Factors, created by Mission.org and brought to you by Highland. If you like this show, please be sure to subscribe or follow on your favorite podcast app. We'd also be so grateful if you rated and reviewed us on Apple Podcasts, as this helps ensure that more listeners find this show. Thanks for listening. I'm Jeremy Bergeron, and I'll catch you next time on Business X Factors. Business X Factors.